Hey guys, it's Paul, combat veteran, MMA fighter, YouTuber, and today we are back checking out the next part of the Siege of Vrax. This is covering the 88th Imperial Siege Army. So, before we get started, do you want to shout out my merch? Right, as you can see, I have a bunch of cool parody merch, t-shirts, stickers, mugs, all of it. You can see it back there, I wear it in the videos. The link is down below. It's worth checking out and it's the best way to support the channel. Okay, having done that, let's get into it and check out the 88th Imperial Siege Army. Some salutations, friends, and welcome back to the Siege of Vrax. Today, we're going to have a look at the attackers, the offensive side, the Imperial Guard 88th Krieg Siege Army. And unlike the Vraxian defenders, whom we don't really know much solid about, the Imperial Guard is a rather bureaucratic army, and we have... Okay, here's what's interesting. In the United States military, those parentheses that enclose... Um, that provide a descriptor after the unit usually talk about some sort of mobility. Um, a, a, a mobility, yeah, a mobility additive that that particular unit has that makes it different from a typical army. So in this case, the 88th Imperial Guard, um, so they wouldn't do it. They wouldn't call it Krieg Army, uh, Krieg Siege Army. In the United States military, so when we would say like the 101st, the classic way is the 101st Division Airborne, right? Or the 1st Cavalry Mechanized. And, you know, obviously in, in, in because of the storied history of some of these units, you know, the 101st Airborne Division is now known by its, its full title. But uh, I even served, there's actually the Connecticut National Guard is something like the, I don't know, 117th infantry regiment mountain and what that represents to planners or people reviewing say the list of units that are going on a deployment it tells them that that particular unit can operate in ways and spaces that typical units of the same designation can't again think like uh, an infantry battalion mechanized tells the planners that you know, unlike the other infantry battalions that have to go on foot, this one can actually go, um, uh, uh, can advance further and faster okay. and can keep up with their armored colleagues, right? Or an armored division, for example. Um, similarly, when you have like, you know, second combat brigade striker, or, you know, it, it tells them that, hey, they have this additional type of vehicle, the striker. So what you would do in this, you wouldn't call it the 88th Imperial Guard Siege Army. You would probably call it the 88th Imperial, I mean, I guess it's implied that it's Imperial Guard. Um, you'd call it the 88th Army Siege, right? Because it has a special uh, designation, sort of. The, actually, yeah, a special designation that tells us something about its mobility and composition. Tells us that actually it's probably less mobile and... Uh, composed of more heavy firepower than a conventionally organized army. But putting it in parentheses to say Krieg is, is, doesn't provide the planners additional helpful information that Siege already doesn't. Again, you have to think less about lore, about like what makes the Krieg uh, guard unique, and, and certainly there's a lot. But if you were a planner, you know, again, you have an entire planet to invade or a subsector, you need to know right away if there's the 88, you know, if there's thousands and thousands of units, you need to know right away if one of those units brings something unique and special to the battlefield, and then you can best use them in that role. So again, you would designate siege to tell them hey you may not want to put this this particular army in your like lightning thrust advance onto the planet pretty damn good idea of the makeup of the 88th siege army first and foremost it was made up of four different types of formations the line corps the assault corps the bombardment corps and independent artillery companies these four different formations all in all made up eight corps Starting with the 1st, 5th, 30th, and 34th Lion Corps, the 8th and 11th Assault Corps, and the 19th and 21st Bombardment Corps. He doesn't need to pluralize core. It's 
already plural. Yeah, the assault corps, right? And the eighth and eleventh assault corps. And finally, we have 14 independent artillery companies that could be attached to any of the previous formations to add a little bit of extra firepower. This leaves us with a general idea of the order of battle. But let's go into a little bit more detail, looking into the various types of formations, starting with the Line Corps. On Vrax, all four Line Corps were organized in the same manner. So as an example, we'll look at the first Krieg Line Corps. It consisted of the 3rd, the 5th, the 15th and the 19th Krieg Siege Regiments. You might already have noticed the fact that these are specifically named Siege Regiments. They are not mechanized regiments, they are not infantry regiments, nor are they artillery regiments. This is because Krieg is one of very few planets within the Imperium that is trusted with the privilege of fielding combined arms formations. Just in case you are not aware, the overwhelming majority of Imperial Guard regiments, something along the lines of 99.9%, .9 are made up of a single arm of the Imperial Guard, be it mechanized, tanks, super heavy, infantry or artillery. The idea behind this is that several regiments will be combined so that they can utilize one another's strengths. For example, an infantry regiment cooperating with an artillery regiment, or an artillery regiment cooperating with a mechanized regiment. Okay, I I'm gonna throw a little flag here and just say that he is describing combined arms operations. Combining at the regiment level disparate types of units to form a, 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 to create a synthesized operational plan is is that is combined arms war fighting right they answer presumably to a single headquarters and those headquarters coordinates their efforts in a single synergistic strategy that's 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 combined arms war fighting they just don't form their combined arms units until they arrive in theater and this is for example, a version of like how modern French militaries do it, right? They are highly modular and are trained in such a way, you know, they have very rigid doctrine, I imagine, so that they can combine and create a mix and match unit that's going to be effective on the battlefield in real time. And that's not unlike what the U.S. military does, right? Um, you know, I, I have been on missions i've commanded actually missions that involved indirect fire assets attached to me uh fixed and rotary wing aircraft um engineers infantry military police um you know afghan forces mechanized a whole host of different forces different combined arms operating together so but they were never under my command for anything but the you know 48 hours that the mission took place and once the, once the unit had completed the operation, they went back to their home units under their home headquarters. So again, it's, it's, I don't think it's fair to say that the Imperial Guard doesn't conduct combined arms operations. They do, they just don't have, they just, they just do so at a, at a scale that makes sense for them, right? Once again, this allows the Imperial Guard overall to call upon the full power of combined arms tactics. However, it does not allow the individual regiment to call upon these tactics by themselves. This might at first seem counterintuitive, and in a way it is, since it leaves every single Imperial Guard regiment individually weaker. And that is precisely the point. You see, the Imperium has had a long problem with chaos, and certain regiments being somewhat untrustworthy. So this system was created to make sure that if any one Imperial Guard regiment was to turn to chaos, or in some other way become corrupted, it could not utilize the full range of tactics that the other Imperial Guard regiments could call upon. The basic idea is that if an artillery regiment turns to chaos, it can easily be overrun by a mechanized and an artillery regiment. Or if an infantry regiment falls to chaos, it can easily be overrun by a mechanized and a tank regiment, and so on and so on. 
It is a way of compartmentalizing the Imperial Guard and managing the risk that is always included when fighting against the vile Arch Enemy, or any other insidious Xenos threat, for example. Krieg, however... Yeah, the problem is is that you, s you don't really mitigate that threat. You end up just with a situation where the the danger the danger is just higher does that make sense right because let's say you have a high enough level general turn to chaos that general can flip the entire core together and the problem is is that you still have these subordinate units so let's say let's say general snuffleupagus turns to chaos is fully corrupted and is going to rebel against the emperor and 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 uh, the imperium well it's possible, right, in, the, in a system of combined arms all the way down, or as far down as is feasible, it's possible that not all of that commander's brigades or regiments will turn to chaos as well. And so some of them could actually delay an infight or break away or sell them out or call the rest of the Imperium and say, hey, I think my commander's ordering me to attack other imperial units um in contrast if you are powerless to resist your headquarters command right you the headquarters and the corrupted elements of that regiment will easily destroy or turn their buddies does that make sense it's like you're trading off it's like high risk high reward you could have lots of purely loyal regiments everywhere or purely loyal armies everywhere but you are in danger of having an entire combined arms army flip and as long as a quorum of people turn to chaos then the there will be no internal dissent i'm not i feel like i'm not explaining it well but it's just like it's it's about risk reward trade-off and that's true of all combined arms operations, right? Like there's a there's a level at which combined arms training is no longer productive, right? We don't need platoons with combined arms training. Well, we do, but we don't need fire teams with combined arms training, right? We don't have a a fire team that's two infantry soldiers and one tanker and a helicopter mechanic, right? That that's ridiculous. That's not helpful. It's only helpful when you have a you know, striker company supporting an infantry company or two infantry companies or whatever. Is an exceedingly loyal world, and in its lengthy history, not a single Krieg regiment has ever fallen to chaos. Thusly, it is one of very few that is trusted with deploying combined arms regiments, and the siege regiments are just such a formation. They can also be deployed in sizes that are considerably greater than the average Imperial Guard regiment, as was the case on Vrax. Now, just the general Imperial Guard regiment can already vary quite considerably in size, depending on the homeworld in question, depending on the type of regiment, depending upon the homeworld's standing within the Imperium, depending upon the task of which it is raised to deal with, etc, etc. It could be anywhere from 2,000 to 20,000 men. However, in the case of the regiments deployed to Vrax, they were massively engorged with each individual regiment consisting of somewhere between a hundred thousand to a hundred and twenty-five thousand men. The then that, that would actually explain why it took them a year to deploy. You know, one of the things I also think is worth talking about is a lot of people complain about the numbers in, the, in Warhammer 40k, like, not really making sense. And certainly that's true in a lot of cases. But one case where it I, I push back on is when people say, oh, how can you possibly say that the Imperium is going to retake the planet of Vrax with a military force that is smaller than the U.S. Army in World War II? And to that I say that you, you don't need to seize the entire planet of Vrax because it's not, most planets in the Imperium, I imagine, are not going to be like Terra, right? Terra is unique in that 
huge swaths of the planet are, I imagine, perfect or were perfectly suited to human life. And so there's human cities everywhere. In contrast, somewhere like Vrax may only have one city where it's habitable at all, right? So in terms of conquering the planet, you may just have to conquer one mid-sized city, in which case 15 million is probably overkill, right? 8 million people, one habitable city, they all sort of live there, right? The wastelands are just too hostile, too inhospitable. No, maybe there's no water. Um, maybe there's uh, temperatures too high or too low for, for life to exist, right? So you conquer the planet of Rax by conquering one city. And I would guess that in the universe, that's probably close to the norm. There's probably a handful of planets where they're only warm enough at their equator or they're only cool enough in their absolute poles or there's only you know accessible water in one tiny spot, right? It could be even like um like there you can only build a city inside one crater where the conditions are just right. Right, so there's all sorts of reasons that a planet, a planet may actually just be a, a you know, a, a handful of cities, a cluster of villages, right? Or they could have a fair population, but nobody cares about what their population is doing. Could be just rural agrarian worlds, you know, 99% of it with one deposit of an essential mineral and one city nearby it, in which case conquering the planet is just seizing that particular mineral resource and the accompanying small city around it, and you've seized the only part of the planet that you care about, right? Because again, if you have a million person army or a hundred thousand person army, what is the remaining 500,000, uh, you know, sheep farmers going to do to you? Nothing. The massive size of these regiments were due to their specialized nature. The Krieg way of waging war is brutal, cold and mathematic. It utilizes massed bombardments, human wave tactics and sheer grinding attrition to overwhelm and crush the enemy. And on Vrax, said enemy could easily number in the millions. And they were all sat in extensive field fortifications designed to resist just such a siege that the Imperium was now forced to commit to. The bloated size of the regiments were designed to be able to absorb the kind of attrition that would be needed to break Vrax, and also allow them to bring to bear enough guns to shatter the enemy's fortifications. Now, let's have a look at this massively bloated monstrosity and how it might have been constructed using the 3rd Krieg Siege Regiment as an example. First, of course, we have the Regimental Headquarters. This would be fully mechanized and equipped with various specialized communications devices to talk to the rest of the formations. Directly attached to the Headquarters and also providing security for the Headquarters would be various specialist formations, mostly grenadiers and engineers, along with a complement of regimental quartermasters and watchmasters, along with their respective staffs. The grenadier and engineer elements would be at roundabout company strength, which means circa 20,000 men, and would be equipped with mostly mechanized forms of transports, either light centaur personnel carriers or chimeras. They would also be equipped with their own dedicated light artillery batteries. After this, the main fighting force of the regiment would be subdivided into five companies. Four. Okay, this is this is actually interesting information. Okay, th this is not an unreasonable array. It's very common for headquarters elements to have an attached company. Um, again, for exactly this reason, to provide force protection and, of course, accompanying staffs to ensure mobility. Yeah, yeah, I'm not seeing anything that's like over the top. Again, some U.S. units don't have a an attached um, like infantry company to headquarters uh, in, in doctrinally, but I'll tell you it almost always happens. Four of these companies would be made up primarily of infantry, with nine infantry platoons consisting of 2,500 men each and an equally strong heavy weapons platoon. In the case of Vrax, the majority of these heavy weapons would be light artillery, like the heavy quad launcher or the mortar, 
along with a few heavy bolters, las cannons, and flamers for general support. These engorged platoons could be further divided into squads, sections, and fire teams, but with the sheer scale of the fighting taking place on Vrax, this was rarely practical. If okay, so what I'm seeing as a regiment is like a is like a battalion, because in in the U.S. Army, at least conventionally, um, a you have a basic you have the squad. Right, the squad is is kind of the core fighting unit, and it's usually, we'll say, you know, I think it can be as low as, probably as low as nine, and as big as twelve. Um, then the three squads ish comprises a platoon or section, and that section again can be as low as twelve and as high as forty. And then sections comprise you have three sections or three platoons plus a headquarters platoon or headquarters section um, and that comprises a company then a comp four companies plus a headquarters company comprises a battalion and uh three ish battalions and a headquarters battalion comprises a brigade and a and several you know three to five brigades of different sorts comprise plus a headquarters brigade or a headquarters element. They're usually not brigade sized at that point. Usually it's like a headquarters company. Uh, comprises a division. Right? And then you have elements like a core and commands, but things get a lot squishy up past the division level. In fact, things are even squishy at the division level. The U.S. Army now fights as brigade combat teams, so you have brigades that are considered modular and, and capable of fighting on their own in theater. Um, so the regiment or division, it, it can be squishy, right? Who's, who's in charge? Usually in a, in a deployed environment, their brigades will be run by a combined joint task force. If anything, so they're again, in, in, in Krieg terminology, it goes, it looks like it goes platoon, company, regiment, and then corps. Corps and then army. A lower ranking officer might be in command of a section of say a hundred men. He would then hand out individual objectives to sergeants, say capturing a specific bunker or capturing a trench line. The sergeant would then take as many men as he thought necessary for the task, and however many he was allowed for the task, and form them into an ad hoc formation, often referred to as a squad or a fire team although these formations rarely consisted of the numbers that we would think of as a squad or a fire team, since attacking anything on Vrax was usually a fairly considerable undertaking. In the case of the specialists, like the grenadiers and engineers, however, things could be quite different. They frequently operated in smaller formations because they were trained to do so, and they also had access to far more competent communications officers and equipment in general to facilitate these smaller scale operations. And finally, we have the fifth company. In the case of siege regiments, this would invariably be an artillery company made up of a smaller number of heavy guns, bombards and earthshakers, but a considerable quantity of lighter artillery pieces used to directly support infantry assaults. The artillery company would also bring along considerable quantities of lighter, heavier weapons, things like heavy bolters, las cannons and missile launchers. These would be assigned to various formations before an attack, and would also be used to secure the regiment's own trench lines against counterattacks. And now, before we sum it all up, let's look at the individual numbers. Each one of the infantry companies would be made up of 25,000 men. The 5th company, the Heavy Company, would consist of some 540 heavy weapons of various types. These weapons would then be crewed, operated, emplaced, commanded, and supplied by a total of 4,000 men. When we subsequently add in the numbers for the various specialists, the grenadiers, engineers, quartermasters, watchmasters, and of course the command staff, we end up at around about 125,000 men, give or take a few hundred. So now that we know the size of a li- Okay, that's wild, because 125,000 is almost the total of the total US troops deployed at any one time during the peak 
of Iraq and Afghanistan. And it's sort of fascinating that these companies will have so f- such. Um, you know, I'd be curious to know if in lore they discuss the logistic issues that these companies at this scale would have to deal with. And even if you're talking about just giving people enough rations to survive, you're still talking about a tremendous challenge. And it's also worth noting that you would have to. You would have to have some sort of logistics headquarters to support this level of operation. 540 guns are still going to need repair parts. They're going to need to be fixed. They're going to need ammunition brought to them. They are going to have to have some sort of coordination cell or coordination element. Even with super advanced technology, um, I assume that there still needs to be a sort of logistical tail to military operations. And that logistical tail takes a lot of manpower. It takes a lot of manpower, takes a lot of coordination, takes a lot of communication, all of which is really hard to master and requires a lot of personnel. People don't appreciate that in World War II, you know, for every one soldier on the front lines there were 12 logistical personnel performing some sort of support duties nowadays that number is more like three to one but that doesn't account for the fact that a lot of traditional military functions have been outsourced to contractors so a lot of our more in-depth vehicle repair was done by contractors that obviously wouldn't be the case for the Krieg army, they would have to have their vehicles or artillery repaired by, you know, other guardsmen. And so that requires, of course, some sort of dedicated repair company and some sort of parts depot and some sort of function of dispersing those parts to the places in the battlefield where they are needed. You know, again, think about fixing ve- the vehicles in the right order in order to have one section ready for an advance at this time and until all the vehicles get repaired we can't start the advance with vehicles that don't work uh you also have things what we call maneuver and mobility support this would be simply just ensuring that everyone on the battlefield moves in a way that makes sense so you know you have to think on a battlefield they don't have traffic lights there is no google maps uh you are learning as you go and you are figuring things out and it's actually very very tough and so that's actually one of the things that it's a secondary function that we learned in military police school was how to ensure maneuver and mobility support and that's things like how to get you know a, a column of 2500 mechanized vehicles to make way for another column of 2500 mechanized vehicles as they pass by say a narrow bridge right because one of those columns may be going to reinforce a fixed line and the other one may be needed to start an offensive right so you have these situations where you have to you know set your priorities, enable maneuver and mobility um, across the battlefield. So these are all really tough things that you don't always think about when you're just like headquarters, staffs, guys with las guns, big boom machines. We're, uh, we're ready to fight. Nah, dude, you're not ready to fight. Iron Corps, let's have a look at the main thrust, the spear tip of the 88th Imperial Guard Siege Army, the Assault Corps of which we have two, the 8th and the 11th. And unlike the Lion Corps, we here have two formations of slightly different size. The general size of the regiments contained within are more or less the same, but you can see here that the 8th was marginally larger than the 11th, consisting of the 7th, the 11th and the 14th tank regiment, along with the 179th siege regiment and the 231st artillery regiment whilst the 11th Assault Corps consisted of the 61st Tank Regiment, the 66th Tank Regiment, the 101st Siege Regiment, and the 497th Siege Artillery Regiment, giving it one less tank regiment than the 8th. Of course, we've already looked at a Siege Regiment, and we'll be looking at an Artillery Regiment in a little bit, so here we'll primarily focus on the Tank Regiment. And we will take the 7th as our example. The name here is 
A little misleading, however, because whilst it does include a considerable quantity of tanks, the tanks themselves are not necessarily the defining feature of an assault corps. Okay, one of the things I want to point out that in the modern military parlance, armor is what is is the term for an armored tracked vehicle with a big friggin' gun on the top of it. A big, yeah, a big gun, right? Um, a tank can confuse people because is a tank a tank or is a tank a a vessel that a large vessel that holds water right like a tanker truck and uh that's not a mistake you want to make in a report but we will get to that in a moment first and foremost the headquarters differing from an infantry regiment the headquarters of a tank regiment is of course an armored vehicle the specific nature of the vehicle in question can vary considerably and is usually up to the commander in question to decide with this I mean it could be a demolisher, it could be a vanquisher, it could be a standard pattern Lehman Russ. It will be kitted out with considerably more powerful communications equipment than the rest of the tanks and it could even be a lightly armoured vehicle. If the commander in question feels that he would be better suited to fulfil his duties by zipping around the battlefield in a salamander armoured personnel carrier with a ton of specialised communications equipment, it is fully within his power to do so. However, since Krieg officers rise up through the ranks, they will probably choose to stay in whatever vehicle they rose to this position commanding, be it a vanquisher, a battle tank, an annihilator, or anything else. This, along with the Krieg mentality of sacrificing oneself for the cause, leads Krieg tank officers to be quite aggressive, to put it mildly. No hiding in the back ranks issuing orders for these guys. Even if they are in a light salamander, they will quite literally be zipping along the front line issuing orders to the various tank formations. If there is one thing you can be sure of, it is that any commander of a Krieg tank regiment is going to be a very hands-on commander. Uh, so that's good. That's a good trait at the company level for sure. Now... With the caveat, I guess, is that command, you should be as close to the battlefield as possible, but no closer than you have to be to maximize your ability to command effectively, right? And this is a tough balancing act because at the end of the day, you need to be where your soldiers are, but... The command position depends on the mission, right? And I'll tell you, sometimes that meant I was the lead vehicle of my formation, right? Because I would be leading them through maybe a route recon or an area that I wasn't that familiar with. And so I would need to make these sorts of decisions. Um, and I needed to have the full picture of the battlefield in front of us, right? But sometimes the answer is you want to be in the middle. This would be something like a combat patrol where you're uh, moving along a known route to try to deter the enemy, right? You're trying to deter them from placing IEDs or whatever. Well, in that case, you're like, all right, I could get contact from the back. I could get contact from the front. And I want to be able to see as much as possible the battlefield from my current position. And in that case, you actually want to be in the middle. And of course... Sometimes you may even actually want to be the trail vehicle in your formation, and this would be a situation often where you are um, leaving an area that you think may be hostile and that you worry about uh, something happening, um, someone trying to attack your formation from behind, right? In which case you want to uh, you know, be as close to that situation as possible. Um, so again, th this is the challenge, but the, as a commander, right, risk for risk's sake is reckless and stupid and the sign of a poor commander. Taking risk to prove your courage is something that as a commander, you should probably be past, right? Um, you know, sacrifice for, the, for a cause is a worthwhile thing. Sacrifice for the sake of sacrifice, right, is is stupid, you know? It's like 
suffering. It's like the people who think that if a workout, the more a workout hurts, the better it is. And that's sort of true to a point, but there's a point where people just hurt themselves without getting stronger, faster, or better. And you ask yourself, well, what was the point of hurting yourself? You didn't make yourself better. All you did was inflict pain for no discernible gain. And a lot of people seem unable to do that calculation in this day and age, and I don't know what the deal is. And due to this somewhat contentious nature, the officer in question is shadowed by three other armored vehicles, forming a standard tank squadron within a regiment. These three tanks will be crewed by the most experienced and veteran members of the entire regiment, whose job it is to try and keep their commanding officer alive. As you can probably imagine, this is not the easiest of tasks. Considering the bellicose nature of the regimental officer, keeping him safe by simply tucking him away somewhere in the back lines is not going to happen. This leaves the bodyguard tanks with essentially two options. The first is to interpose themselves between the officer and any incoming fire, a often necessary maneuver, though preferably a maneuver to be avoided, as even within the Krieg cult of sacrifice, needless sacrifice is not looked upon in a particularly bright light. The preferred alternative then is B to blast, brutalize, and break anything and everything that may pose a threat to their commander. A task that the Krieg bodyguard tanks have gotten very, very good at. The downside, of course, to being so very good at their jobs is that the commander in question might find this particularly emboldening and decide that since he has such excellent subordinates, it might be safe to go even closer to the front lines. Yeah, actually, that, that, that sounds like a real dynamic that would absolutely play out. In the immortal words of an unnamed Imperial Commissar, drive me closer, for I wish to hit them with my sword. But of course, even the bravest commander cannot be expected to smite all of the heretics by himself, and thus the regiment is divided into the usual five companies. The first company will be the main armoured strength of the regiment, consisting of something along the lines of 1,000 tanks divided into squadrons of four vehicles, where one vehicle will be the command vehicle and the other three being his squadron, his wingmates if you wish. And the squadron can further be divided into two teams of one lead tank and one supporting tank. That's That, that four tank formation is actually how a uh, a real tank um, platoon works. I also use the word tank here very deliberately, rather than for example Lehman Russ, because this tank company can be made up of a wide variety of different armored vehicles. Also, one headquarters element for a thousand tanks is preposterous. It, it just is. If you, it, like, like there has to be other levels of command tracking these tanks, their crew. I mean, what happens if one crew member in a tank gets killed? You have to reassign the crew from somewhere else. Well, where do you get a crew from somewhere else? Well, who, you know, maybe you po poach them from another tank that's currently damaged. Well, how many tanks are damaged? Well, you have a thousand. You have no idea, right? Especially when you're talking about a commander in a tank driving around the battlefield doing other stuff. So, th right, these are the questions that... You know, imagine trying to constantly reshuffle, constantly rebalance re uh, every crew whose tank is damaged or inoperable against every single tank, operable tank whose crew was injured or killed. It, it's just, it's too much, right? It's too much to do at a scale of a thousand tanks and, you know, 5,000 soldiers. Vehicles of a particular type will be organized into squadrons consisting entirely of that type of vehicle. Then, depending on the type, the squadron will be given a designation and a specialized task. For example, a squadron made up of five destroyers will be formed into an anti-tank detachment, whilst a squadron of four Lehman Russ demolishers will be given infantry support tasks. Additionally, the vehicles in the company need not necessarily be battle tanks. 
There could, for example, be a squadron of light flamethrower tanks like the Hellhounds, or a squadron of super heavies like the Baneblades or Shadow Swords. Alternatively, and more usually, the Super Heavies would be formed into their very own companies, and be divided into their own squadrons within said company. This Super Heavy company would then be attached to the Assault Corps Headquarters, or even, indeed, the Army Headquarters, and then be assigned to the various formations as needed, since these incredibly powerful and valuable vehicles were rarely put at risk unless absolutely necessary. That, that also makes a lot of sense, right? That they would be their own company attached to headquarters that would then get dispersed out. Yeah, that's a pretty typical modern military way of solving that problem of highly specialized units. The idea, of course, between divide... But again, think about it. How many of those subordinate regiments do you think request Baneblade support? Right? Probably... I mean, they probably get dozens of requests. Or, or maybe in this military culture, in this martial culture, like, you never request anything, right, other than what's absolutely necessary to ensure that your people are fed. I mean, maybe that's possible. It's just like you get what you get. Don't ask for a Bane Blade. We don't care. We're not going to give it to you. You're going to get what you get. But that's not true because we've seen, well... We've seen in Hell's Reach, for example, uh, the Steel Legion asks for reinforcements and it gets denied. And so I imagine they also permit units to ask for things like, hey, we're low on ammunition. Hey, we are at 60% casualties. Hey, we are haven't had food or we don't have sufficient water to survive, right? So there has to be some sort of communication up the chain. Um, so, yeah, you wonder if they get requests for Bane Blades that they have to sort through and sift sift out, or if the rule is you can't request augmented forces for any reason. Dividing the tank company into these various specialized squadrons is so that the various squadrons can support one another, and also so they can easily be doled out to the various infantry formations, since the primary purpose of the armor on Vrax would be to facilitate the creation of a breakthrough by aiding the infantry that are bashing their poor little heads in against the fortified front lines of Vrax. And then secondly, once a breakthrough has been created, to rush through the hole and exploit it. And as you can probably imagine, there is a considerable difference between bashing your head against a fortified line of bunkers and trenches and rushing across the open plains. Obviously then, you're going to be wanting a very very different tools. To break open the bunker lines, you'll want the fairly precise destroyers to blast out bunkers and to destroy tanks in their fortified positions. And of course the demolishers to simply just delete said bunkers and to collapse enemy trenches with their big fat HE shells. Whilst, when you're exploiting a breakthrough, you might want something fast and nippy, yet still capable of overrunning the occasional strongpoint, like the Hellhound, or you'll want something capable of engaging the enemy over long distances in case of a large-scale enemy counterattack, like, for example, the Lehman Ross Vanquisher. Mm. I mean, I can understand prior to actually getting onto Vrax, it probably it was probably really confusing, I imagine, to determine what exactly makeup of an army you needed. And then, of course, once the Imperium gives you the army, they're not going to let you complain about it and be like, you gave me too many vanquishers. But when you want to exploit a breakthrough, right? And this is one of the reasons that Armored Warfare sort of spelled the, diff spelled the end um, of Trench Warfare is that if you can break the trench at even a single point because of the nature of trench works and trench warfare, they, right, their power is that from behind they are accessible and from in front they are impenetrable. So if you can get behind a trench line, it will be a massacre. Right, because the trench line has no protection from behind, or minimal protections, right? Bunkers are a little different, but even bunkers, right, they have a field of fire facing out towards the enemy, but they don't really have the ability to fire behind them. So you've got this, so once you had forces that were so mobile 
that they could exploit a breakthrough and engage the enemy from behind, then they were able to cripple, a, tear open a huge wound in a trench line, right? Because what should have been a reinforcing, like reinforcements filling the trench back in, instead becomes like a, a, a tanks from behind tearing apart huge chunks of the trench line then the infantry can come in and once the infantry have compromised inside your trench line again you the infantry the attacker gains the advantage because they're attacking at an angle right trench lines are optimized for one thing and that is fighting the enemy in front of you so again something to think about as far as tactics here go is that you would want fast relatively fast armored hard hitting units however the hellhound would in all due likelihood be too lightly armored to be much help in the main bashing their head scene against the defenses part and the vanquisher's high velocity cannon doesn't carry anywhere near as much good old-fashioned he as the big fat low velocity cannon of the demolisher yeah i think demolishers are probably the tanks they would want that's the armored vehicle they would want to bring that you would want is so if I had if I if I knew that they had so many armored forces and that my opponents had almost no armor forces, right? Or or they had armor forces, I'm sure, mechanized armored forces. Um but they don't have the sophistication to launch a full scale assault, what you would do is launch a your first attack at one angle, right? At let's say the three o'clock position of the encirclement of the city and you would use your intelligence to track as your enemy responded by reinforcing that sector ideally reinforcing it with other armored vehicles right so maybe that's where you have your destroyers come in and destroyers poke at them and they see a tank and they freak out and they put their own tanks to defend that sector and you ratchet up the pressure a little bit right and they throw more tanks at it and more personnel and they really think that that's the sector where the battle's happening and then, because you are outside, right, there's no, they are trapped in the city, you are outside the city, their intelligence is bad, you can look into them, right? Then you just have your demolishers just find another sector that's a good distance away, and the demolishers just punch hard through the now weakened opposite side sector. Right? Or like if you're fighting, if your feint is at the 3 o'clock, you attack at like the, the 12 o'clock or the like 7 o'clock, right? Some unexpected direction. And when you punch through hard with the demolishers, you follow it with an infantry line and you to turn, you turn, um, well, that's the term, you execute a turn and you advance through the trench line, collapsing it as you go, Right? folding the enemy into themselves because their their bunker line is no is now working against them it's trapped them in those positions so this is why yeah with armored warfare it's it's just too easy to facilitate a breakout if yeah it's too it's too easy to facilitate a breakout and especially against a fully trapped enemy right they so going to be way less useful against the bunker lines and whilst, of course, the Imperial Guard is justly famed for being a very large hammer and therefore turning every problem into a nail, the Krieg Regiment, despite their somewhat blunt approach to problem solving, are not above employing a little bit of finesse here and there, since all of their officers have made their ways up from the bottom ranks. They are experienced and, before all, expedient commanders. If a problem can be solved quicker and easier via the utilization of the correct tool, and said tool happens to be in their toolbox, they are more than happy to use it as well. And speaking of the toolbox, let's have a look at the size of this one in particular. We do not know exactly what types of vehicles or what numbers they were in, but we do know the rough size of the company. Being equally engorged as its infantry equivalent, it would contain some 1,000 vehicles, and they would in turn be crewed by four to 6,000 men, taking into account variations in numbers of crews, with the standard Lehman Russ having four, but occasionally also having six with two sponson-mounted heavy weapons. 
But of course, tanks alone are hardly going to be enough, and considering the defensive lines on Vrax could be many kilometers deep, simply just rushing through with armor and hoping for the best was not a valid option. So we are going to be needing some infantry. That's where the 2nd, 3rd and 4th company comes in, with the 2nd company being worthy of particular notice since it was equipped with Gorgon Heavy Assault Transports. And to give you an idea of exactly why that is so important, let me first introduce you to the Centaur, Universal Carrier, shown here with a rough size comparison to a Guardsman. The Centaur is a light vehicle used for all manners of things. It transports ammunition, men, officers, the wounded, general equipment, and can even tow light artillery pieces. It is the workhorse of the 88th Siege Army, but it's not very big nor is it very well armed or armoured. It can carry a half a squad of five or six men with decent speed and mobility, more than enough to keep up with the tanks, although it's going to be offering very little in the way of protection while doing so. It is not at all suited for attacking heavily fortified positions, as even a heavy machine gun could quite easily defeat its front llama. Thusly, the men of Krieg need something a bit heavier to transport them to the enemy lines. That is where the Gorgon comes in, and this is a pretty good approximate size comparison. The Gorgon Heavy Assault Transport is designed to carry five full squads, 50 men, straight up to the front of an enemy bunker, then hose it down with its array of secondary and primary weaponry before disgorging its complement of infantry. A Gorgon comes standard with two twin sets of heavy stubbers for a total of four heavy machine guns and four heavy sponson mounted weaponry. These could be mortars, heavy flamers or heavy bolters. But its primary function, the delivery of vast quantities of infantry, is facilitated by its main feature, its forward assault ramp. This not only eases the de-embarkation of the infantry mounted on the Gorgon, it also acts as an additional meter of shock absorbent frontal plating, being able to move independently from the Gorgon's primary chassis. It is able to stop practically anything at the very least once, and should be able to weather the worst that any defensive line can throw at it. It is also designed to be easily removed and replaced with a fresh assault ramp, since, as you can probably imagine, it does tend to take a fair bit of a beating. And the second company, consisting of some 20,000 grenadiers, would have 400 of these monstrosities, enough to carry the entire company into battle. This means that these heavy companies would undoubtedly be the premier assault troops in the entire 88 Siege Army. Whilst the 3rd and 4th company were primarily mechanized formations designed to support the tanks, primarily equipped with centaurs and the occasional chimera, although both companies also possessed 100 gorgons for additional heavy assault support. Additionally, the Gorgons of the 2nd, 3rd and 4th company were often detached from their parent formations when they didn't have anything in particular to do, and were seconded to other formations to act either as the lead forces of an assault or more usually as the finishers. Once the 1st infantry assaults had discovered weaknesses in the enemy's front lines, specialized troops assigned to the regiment in question would then board the borrowed gorgons and use them to approach the weak points in the enemy's front line and break them wide open. Then finally we have the 5th company, which was the primary regimental reconnaissance company, consisting of death riders and light scout vehicles, including salamanders and chimera scout tanks. Depending on the makeup of the company, be it primarily made up of death riders or light vehicles, could considerably impact the size of the formation, but generally speaking it would be around about 20,000 men, the same as a usual specialist company. How many death riders and how many light armoured formations was primarily up to the regimental commander himself and his personal preference. Now, you might think that utilising light armour would automatically be better than cavalry, but Let's just say that the Death Riders of Krieg are nothing like regular cavalry. Yeah, yeah, all I'm hearing is that this is an army perfectly built to break 
through lines. Under a better commander, this would be a year-long battle at most that would have probably been decisively decided in the first battle, right? A simple feint, divert your enemy, get them to commit their reserve to another point in the battlefield, and once that reserve is committed, then you strike at your preferred meth area of attack, right? You know there's no reinforcements. You know you have a numerical advantage. You punch through with your Bane Blades. You punch through with your Destroyers. And you back them up with the Gorgons. The Gorgons start, right? You split them right through the middle. And you start clearing trench lines. Once you open up, a, a, you know, a, even a two-mile wide or a three-mile wide hole, easy for you to have your infantry enter that hole and begin to sweep through the lines of your enemy forces it once you get enough of course you get a numerical advantage as you kill them off and seize their equipment and you force them into a tighter and tighter pocket with fewer and fewer troops to do so especially when you've killed a large portion of their troops and the battle is effectively decisively won of course i have a feeling based on the length of time this took, and the fact that that is not an authorized strategy, uh, that this is instead going to be a stupid, ridiculous saga in which they waste men and men's lives for no discernible reason. And many of a Creed commander has grown rather fond of their mobility, and also the sheer punch they can deliver if they can make it to the enemy in one piece. And then finally we can summarize the total size of the 7th Krieg tank regiment, though we also need to factor in the crew manning the various forms of transportation within it. Now the Gorgons are a little tricky because they can be crewed by as few as 3 men or as many as 7 men, but for the purpose of this video we are going to be assuming the largest crew size of 7. Then we have the various mechanized transports in the 3rd and 4th company. All in all, we're looking at something along the lines of 11,000 men, giving us a total, including the fighting personnel, of 97,000. And now that we know the size of the infantry siege regiments and the tank regiments, the only thing left is the artillery regiment, of which there were six divided between two bombardment corps. The 19th and the 21st, consisting respectively of the 3rd, 4th and 8th Siege Artillery Regiment and the 19th, 22nd and 23rd Siege Artillery Regiment. And just like the tank and infantry formations, the artillery was equally, if not even more so, engorged, and consisted primarily of heavy guns. The light artillery was supposed to reside within the infantry siege regiment and in the tank support. The Bombardment Corps, meanwhile, was supposed to bring the heavy guns, the bunker busters, the line destroyers, the hammer with which the Vraxian defenses would be smashed. And they sure were mighty big hammers indeed. For this example, let's have a look at the 19th Siege Artillery Regiment, since in this case all of the regiments were once again of a uniform size and organization. And as usual, we start, of course, with the regimental headquarters. Artillery regiments tend to be fairly officer-heavy, as they will require large numbers of command personnel to direct the various guns, and perhaps far more importantly, make sure that the guns are fed. An entire siege artillery regiment firing away, possibly for days at a time, devours astronomical quantities of shells, and organizing the continued delivery of this vast amount of ammunition is quite the task in and of itself. Thusly, regimental headquarters has a considerable command staff beneath it, consisting... Okay, so they appreciate the fact that delivering shells to artillery pieces is really challenging. Um... But they just decide that that's a role of command staff. And maybe in, maybe in the Astra Militarum, that if you handle logistics at all, you're an officer or you're considered command staff personnel. But it's just strange that a, a, a tank, an armored unit, which requires the same, has the same ammunition requirements as a fixed artillery piece, right? It's... A tank is first and foremost an artillery piece on tracks. 
sort of. I, I, I know. But it is logistically has the same requirements, plus it has all the requirements intrinsic to making it go. Right? Fuel, spare parts, lubrication, power plants, cr like crew that know what they're doing, etc., etc of watchmasters, quartermasters, and also a wide array of specialist personnel. We're talking engineers, surveyors, map makers, artillery experts, maintenance chiefs, logistical officers, radio operators, wiremen, etc, etc, and in addition to that, a considerably sized guard force. And just- Yeah, where's this for the, again, more complicated tank regiments? To be clear, when I say guard force, I do not mean imperial guard, I mean guard force, in the most literal sense, seeing as the artillery regiments will build up headquarters security, massive stockpiles of ammunition, the kind of thing the enemy would be very fond of infiltrating and detonating, if at all possible. Due to the somewhat disastrous consequences of that happening, the ammunition dumps were quite literally the most important locations in the entire army, and as such were heavily guarded with dedicated troops. Of course, the various regiments had their own de facto military police, as well as overall army forces in the form of the watchmasters and their staff, but in the case of the artillery parks, considerably more in the way of manpower and expertise was needed. And speaking of expertise, as mentioned, the artillery regiment was particularly top heavy, and the considerable guard forces required was run and organized by a sizable detachment of watchmasters, all with their own private staff and enforcement officers. And then of course there are the quartermasters, a chapter all of their very own. The Siyut Artillery Regiment employs dozens of quartermasters, each with his own considerable staff of adepts, clerks and tallymen, who in turn often have their own personal staffs to boot. Mmm, okay, that sounds more like... Again, this, this seems like the only one that's properly fleshed out the logistics that would have to happen to fight on this scale. So it's interesting again, and maybe Arch is just emphasizing it here the most... But this is how it would have to go uh, for almost every command regiment, uh, save perhaps for light dismounted infantry, which could scale back their headquarters just a little bit, right? Maybe like 25% smaller, 30% smaller. But honestly, if you've if you've never if you've never worked in this sort of environment and at this scale and understood and seen the extreme complexity that it entails, I, I, I can't describe to you how essential it is to have these headquarters personnel or to have some sort of very intelligent, like n maybe narrow AI that can do some of these things. Like if you had, you know, perhaps if you had, for example, a uh, sensors on every part of your artillery piece that could immediately alert like a computer system to say hey i have broken i am the uh, artillery pieces uh you know left front wheel axle and it pings it up and says hey deliver left front wheel axle this location this unit this regiment right maybe something like that could save some personnel but i don't it, i've never seen any evidence that the imperium behaves that way you know the quartermasters and their various staffers and sub-staffers alone would number in the thousands, which may seem excessive, but trust me, it is eminently necessary. A single artillery regiment firing full force can eat through hundreds of thousands of shells every hour, and these barrages can go on for days. It is beyond a Herculean task to keep track of just the ammunition requirements alone, and that's before we get into all of the other things the Quartermasters need to replenish. Men, guns, food, boots, fuel, uniforms, and the huge selection of replacement and spare parts required not only for the guns, whom are regularly stressed to the absolute breaking point, but also the hundreds of vehicles needed to transport it all. Mm. It is. See what I mean? This is where I talk about the complexity of it all, right? And what happens, remember, the same problems we talked about with the armored vehicles are going to have to happen with the unarmored vehicles, right? 
who's going to drive the trucks? Well, what happens when you have a good truck if the crew is dead? Or the truck is down, but the crew's fine. How are you going to cross, you know, you got to cross load them, right? And where are you going to accept risk? And where are you going to reinforce when you start running out? How long is it going to take you to train fresh infantry to drive these vehicles, right? These are the sort of like second, third, fourth order effects that you need to consider. You know, it, it goes all the way down, right? Who's going to actually move these soldiers around the battlefield? They're going to walk, could take days. So someone's got to go pick them up. With what? With who? You know? Then you have another layer of vehicles ferrying personnel around the battlefield. All right? It's it's wild. I mean, to give you an idea of how complex the movement of soldiers is, when I was deployed, they had a shuttle service. They contracted civilian helicopters. They had old Hueys, UH-60 helicopters, like from the Vietnam War, civilianized versions. And all these helicopters would do is you would submit a list the day prior. You would say, hey, is there space? I need to get a space from when you come and pick up from, you know, FOB XYZ, and they're going to FOB ABC, and do you have space on your shuttle? And they'd say, yep, we got space. So you would just wait at the at the um, heliport, right, just a concrete slab at, you know, whatever time the shuttle was going to get there, 1 o'clock, and you would hop in, they'd pick the helicopter would pick off, it'd fly you to three other fobs, buh, 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 and then when it landed at XYZ, you got off. You know? It was like a bus route. But it was just helicopters. And it was so many people shuffling around places that it, they just ran continuously, all day and night, around and around and around and around, all over the bases, a whole network. And that was for, remember, 125,000 troops. Is at least a small mercy that the Administratum Labor Corps and the Mechanicus take care of the transportation from the freshly built spaceport to the rear lines, but even then, millions of tons of supplies need moving, storing, allocating, and replenishing every single day. So having thousands of de facto administrators running around, whilst it might seem strange, the Death Corps never do anything without a reason, and this is most definitively a good reason to have them around. And so, when we add in all of the administrators to all of the guards, the regimental headquarters alone numbers some 10,000 men. A solid half of that is various administrative personnel, like the quartermasters and the watchmasters. And then, of course, we get to what they are actually in charge of supplying with all of these shells. The various companies, or in this case, battery commands we have the first oh, i appreciate them calling it batteries yeah in the u.s military battery is the stand-in for a company if you're an artillery unit second third and fourth battery command as well as a logistical company within the siege artillery regiment this logistical company is however not purely to move ammunition around that is of course its primary task but it also contains a considerable number of engineering vehicles to dig the various positions required for the guns and also to dig out the underground shelters for the temporary storage of their ammunition. But we'll get to that. First, we're going to have a look at the battery commands. The first, second and third battery commands are essentially identical, whilst the fourth is a wee bit different. But again, we'll get to that as well. First, let us look at the first battery command. As previously mentioned, it is expected that the various siege infantry regiments bring their own light supporting artillery, whilst the siege artillery is responsible for bringing the heavy guns. And in this case, we are talking about two guns in particular to carry out two different tasks. First, we have the long-barreled Earthshaker cannon and the shorter-barreled Medusa siege gun. Let's start with the Earthshaker. The workhorse artillery piece of virtually all Imperial Guard regiments. And not without good reason. The Earthshaker cannon has a good rate of fire, solid accuracy, and perhaps most importantly of all, it is supremely reliable. An Earthshaker cannon is expected to be able to fire for days at a time with only routine maintenance, without any sort of extensive replacement or spare parts. However, this reliability does come at the expense of a somewhat small shell. 
the Earthshaker Cannon with a seven-man assigned crew fires a 132mm 38kg shell over 15 kilometers. The range can be increased to 20 to 25 kilometers by increasing the powder charge. A yeah, that's um, that's a huge, huge, huge shell. I mean, a 38 kilogram shell is what, like 70 pounds? No, no, it'll be like 90, 90 to 100 pounds. Yeah. Process known as supercharging. However, this will put a considerably larger strain upon the weapon's barrel and should not be done for more than 20 rounds at a time, and the gun should then not be fired again before the barrel can be thoroughly checked and possibly even replaced. Can you imagine the logistical nightmare of replacing all of those barrels? The range can also be increased yet further with the utilization of specialized Adeptus Mechanicus ammunition which increased the range well in excess of 30 kilometers without putting any further strain upon the gun barrel. However, such ammunition is extremely rare and precious and is only handed out in small quantities and only used when they absolutely have to. Outside of such extenuating circumstances, the primary role of the Earthshaky Cannon is to deliver vast quantities of ammunition during extended artillery barrages. This, of course, has a wide variety of potential applications, but on Vrax, the primary role for the Earthshakers was to deliver something known as a box barrage. The idea behind such a barrage is rather simple, but pulling it off effectively can be quite difficult, so let's have a quick look at it, just so you understand the concept. So, as mentioned, at the basic level it is fairly simple. If you're attacking an enemy position, you want to make sure that you can attack and overwhelm said position. A complication that might make this considerably more difficult is if the enemy starts pouring reinforcements into said position. Since now you're going to have to fight against what is potentially a limitless amount of enemies to capture said position. And since you are on the offensive, that in all due likelihood means that the enemy, being on the defensive, has all kinds of advantages, meaning that you really, really don't want a drawn out extended fight. You want to overrun the position as swiftly as possible. As discussed, unless it's a feint and you want them to commit their reserves, which is what he is describing. And preferably, move on from said position also as swiftly as possible. The box barrage is designed to help achieve this objective, and it does so by attempting to cut off the point in question from enemy reinforcements by placing, quite literally, a box of fire around it, pulverizing the nearby area and making any movement of reinforcements too risky to be worth it. As you can see, it's a very simple idea, but- That's the stupidest idea I've ever heard think about it. If you don't want the enemy to be reinforced, you can also just put rounds directly on the enemy's location. And then, then, once your friendly forces are about to seize the objective, then you sweep your artillery either back or to the side. And it's easy because your friendlies can tell you they're on the ground. They can help direct the artillery because they are in the fight now. Right? Instead of having to guess. Plus, you know exactly what's going to happen when the box shows up. Right? It, yeah. This is needlessly complex, too much work, and preserves enemy combat power when you don't have to. But it is incredibly difficult to actually pull off, as it will require hundreds of artillery pieces firing in precise coordination with exact coordinates for an extended period of time. On the other hand, the potential benefits, if done correctly, could be considerable, since gaining a foothold within the enemy's lines would be the decisive factor in finally breaking through said line. Well, at least, but of course, at least Arch appreciates that as being indeed the decisive factor. It would be much easier to break through the line if the line simply isn't there anymore. And that's where the second gun comes in, the Medusa Siege Gun. The Medusa is a heavy howitzer, or a bombard. 
In this case, Bombard is a general catch-all term for the heavy siege guns of the 88th Krieg Siege Army. Generally speaking, we are talking about a 305mm howitzer with an effective range of 10 to 12 kilometers, firing a light HE shell of some 280 kilograms or a heavy 400 kilograms delayed fused bunker buster. It is also capable of firing a special Adeptus Mechanicus burrowing shell. This shell utilizes ancient technology to literally bore its way into the ground after impacting and can thusly burrow itself dozens of meters straight into underground bunkers, dugouts or ammunition depots. However, this ammunition is also very, very, very rare even more rare than the Admech shells for the Earthshakers, and thusly are only used if they absolutely have to knock out a particular position, or if they're lucky enough to figure out the location of an enemy ammunition dump. But in reality, this kind of precision strike is not what the Medusa siege gun was designed for. It is designed to be employed in large numbers to simply pulverize enemy defenses. The first shell might not destroy a bunker, the second shell might not destroy a bunker, nor may the third, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth, the seventh, the eighth, the ninth, or the tenth, but number eleven, it might do the job, and if it doesn't, number twenty might, or thirty, or forty, and so on, and so on, and so on. Even the sturdiest of bunkers will eventually crack under a sustained bombardment from these heavy howitzers. The downside is their relatively slow rate of fire, especially compared to the Earthshaker cannon. This is due to the simple fact that a massive gun requires an equally massive shell, and said massive shell requires specialized lifting equipment to reload the weapon. Additionally, lobbing a 400 kilogram shell over 10 kilometers requires a rather mighty drive charge, which is not at all gentle upon the barrel meaning that the Medusas require frequent and meticulous maintenance. But fortunately, the Imperial Guard, and Krieg in particular, have figured out a solution to the rate of fire problem. The solution is simply to have a metric ass ton of guns. We talk about the logistics. There's not enough of these troops dedicated to logistics in this array. I mean, I would just assume maybe they they operate like if there's not a charge, an infantry charge, the infantry get retasked to do maintenance and run these parts back and forth and maintain vehicles and do refueling and hauling ammo. I, it, it, there's just no explanation for the lack of logistics. Because if a weapon only fires once every 10 minutes, all you need to do to have it fire every minute is to have 10 guns. And that was precisely the kind of solution that the Death Corps had in mind for Vrax. So, let us return to the 19th Siege Artillery Regiment. As mentioned, there were three primary batteries, each made up of several sub-batteries made up either of Earthshakers or Bombards. There were a couple of other extremely specialized batteries as well, but frankly their numbers were so few and so specialized in nature that they're not really worth mentioning here, as the overwhelming majority of the guns would be Earthshakers or Bombards, because they were the two types of artillery that they primarily needed, one to block off enemy reinforcements and to pound the living shit out of anything that dared move across no man's land, and one to smash fortifications. All in all, a battery command would be made up of 2,160 guns and 16,000 men. Within this formation, the average battery size was around 10 guns, although this was highly malleable. For example, let's say that they needed to destroy a particularly heavily fortified bunker complex. In that case, a large number of bombards could be gathered together as a single grand battery. Yeah, we've, we've talked about this. This is this is how militaries operate. This is probably how they operated in World War One, right? Of course, you're gonna reshuffle your equipment in a way that that enables you to execute your operation as planned. 
These formations would subsequently be seconded to other formations, be it infantry or tanks for example, and used to fulfil a specific task. Or, potentially, they could also be seconded to a particular objective, as in the case of the destruction of the bunker complex. The second and third battery commands would also be the same size as the first battery command, 2,160 guns and 16,000 men. But this is where it gets a little bit different, because Battery C was not an artillery battery. This was a AAA and support battery, though considerably smaller than it would normally be. In this case, around about 1,000 pieces of variant types of AAA and 8,000 men. This also included a fair bit of support equipment like engineering the- Worth noting, AAA stands for anti-aircraft artillery. Vehicles. This was due to the fact that they did not expect any serious amount of aerial resistance on Vrax. No Imperial Navy aeronautica forces were stationed on the planet once it turned, and Vrax was not known to have any PDF aeronautica forces, meaning that a large contingent of anti-aircraft was simply not necessary. I think I just found where they got all their extra drivers, and ammo haulers, and repairers. But Krieg does not like doing anything halfway, so they added in a demi battery command of AAA and some additional engineering and support vehicles. Worst case scenario, the engineering vehicles would certainly be useful, and many of the AAA batteries, like for example the Hydra Flak battery with its quad autocannons, could easily be turned upon enemy defences, and whilst of course four autocannons, significant amount of firepower as that might be, that would never bust a bunker open, it sure as hell would make damn sure that the occupants of said bunker kept their heads well and truly to the ground. And then finally, the fifth company, the Logistical Company. Perhaps one of the most important companies in the entire artillery regiment, because regardless of how many guns the regiment might have, if they don't get any ammunition, they're fairly useless after all. And thusly, the Logistical Company is also the single largest company in the 19th Siege Artillery Regiment, with a full 20,000 men, most of them operating Trojans and Centaur carriers, carrying ammunition to and from the various depots, along with engineering vehicles, and of course armoured recovery vehicles and artillery tractors. Every single gun already has a artillery tractor assigned to it as a part of its seven-man assigned crew, but... Well, let's just say that lightly armoured artillery tractors have a somewhat short life expectancy on the front line, considering how often the massed batteries of Krieg draw the attentions of enemy massed batteries. Having a couple dozen replacements here and there would not go amiss. The logistical company is also one of fairly few formations in the entire 88 Siege Army that are very rarely seconded to any other formations, purely because they're usually kept so very, very busy that there's really no real leeway to second them to anybody but their assigned regiment. That would make sense, yeah. Yeah. Though I am curious about this idea that, like, all batteries firing all the time. Um, uh, it shouldn't be... Okay, it shouldn't... It doesn't need to be that way. Right? Like, you know, at some point, there's like, it's like the law of diminishing returns, right? If you fire your artillery at the same point continuously, eventually they're going to harden those positions in such a way that you don't really deal any damage by throwing another additional shell. So then why just run them and run them and run them and run them, right? So then, all in all, this leaves us with the 19th Siege Artillery Regiment with a total of 76,000 men and 7,480 guns total, including the AAA. So then, now that we know the size of the individual regiments, let's have a look at the 88 Siege Army in all its glory. First and foremost, the Line Corps. The four Line Corps, the 1st, 5th, 30th and 34th, would number some 2 million men. The Assault Corps, the 8th and the 11th, with the 11th being slightly smaller than the 8th, would number some 887,000 men. The two Bombardment Corps, the 19th and the 21st, would number 304,000 men. 
And finally, we would have the independent artillery companies, adding yet another 224,000 men and some 30,240 additional guns. This gives us a total size of 3.4 million men. And to put that yet further into perspective, these 3.4 million men were attacking an area roughly the size of the county of Northumberland in England. Not a very big area. Of course, they landed a significant distance away from the main fortifications of Rax, so the total battlefield would be a fair bit larger, but the area in which they were attacking was around about 5,000 square kilometers which is not a lot of ground for this many troops. Nope. Nope. This is this is definitely uh the, the idea that this took 17 years to do is 100% a fiction or a reflection of just an atrociously bad command. And of course, these are just the fighting men. If we add in the various support staffs, the Administratum Labor Corps, the Adeptus Mechanicus contingents for running the large trains and organizing the supply yards, etc., we're probably looking at something along the lines of four to five million, but who cares about the non-combatants anyway? Not like they're going to be the stars of the show, now are they? So, now- Well, uh, unless you know a little bit about militaries, You'll know that logistics, and I, I say this as someone who wasn't a Logie, uh, logistics are the, is what you win wars with. Now you've got a good idea of just how large the 88th Siege Army is. The question then is, how well will this force fare against the defenders of Vrax? To find that out, you'll have to keep watching the series, won't you? Whoo, guys, that was long. That was long, and man, was it was it boring. Thank you guys for sticking with me. Uh, and man, I this this was just ridiculous, right? So many things don't make any sense um, about the way this is organized, uh, the the tactics that the army is meant to use. Um, it's just it's just totally. I mean, it's it's one of those things that. You can tell this is written by a writer who really loves history, who really wants to connect with that World War II or World War I image, but doesn't really understand the way things really worked, right? The way that powerful massed tanks would have not allowed the war to proceed as it did. And we know this because the war was fought, especially in the early phases, uh, World War II blitzing through Belgium, was the exact same thing in World War I as World War II. And in World War II, thanks to the presence of tanks and mechanized forces, the there was never a trench line that was settled upon. There was never trench warfare uh, in long term. <sighs> anyway, guys, be sure to check out the merch store, check out the second channel, check out the Instagram. Thank you so much for sticking around. And until next time, I will see you guys later.